Beyond the Arctic Circle in Russia, a Red Army soldier, 35 meters high, watches over the city of Murmansk. Located in the northeast of the country, Murmansk is the largest port in the Russian Arctic. It is also home to a huge military naval base, housing half of the Navy's nuclear submarines and a fleet of nuclear icebreakers. The year is 2019. Today, the renowned city celebrates the launch of the world's first floating nuclear power plant. The Academic Lomonosov. Among the senior officials who attended the celebration, meet Alexei Likachev, head of Rosatom, the Russian nuclear giant. Here is Vladimir Putin's former deputy economy minister. Возвращаясь к теме плавучей станции, в станции Академик Ломоносов, единственное в мире уникальное решение по совмещению энергетической установки и судовых компетенций. И технологические параметры, связанные с длиной топливного цикла, с энергетической эффективностью, тоже уникальны. The power station a 140 meter long by 30 meter wide ship painted entirely in the colors of Russia, white, blue, and red. Only a small group of journalists was able to visit it. We are the only ones from French television. The location is sensitive and the visit is highly supervised. <laughs> Installing a nuclear power plant on a boat seems like a crazy idea, and it worries the journalists. Among them is a Japanese man. Since the Fukushima disaster in 2011, people in his country are highly sensitive to everything concerning nuclear safety. The plant director agrees to answer questions. Заказ спроектирован, построен в соответствии с такими нормами, чтобы и требованиями, чтобы данный объект не пострадал при падении вертолета. Он защищен от таранного воздействия, столкновения, пробития корпуса. Да? This journalist comes from Finland, located just 150 kilometers from Murmansk. Greenpeace называет ее Чернобыль на льду. Реактор как-то похож на Чернобыльский реактор? Знаете, я вам буду говорить только лишь про данный объект. На сегодняшний день это самый отработанный реактор, который используется в России. Это транспортный реактор. Он модифицирован. Все требования надзорных федеральных органов, они учтены, поэтому считаю его полностью безопасным. Спасибо. Спасибо. A few minutes later, the sailors cast off. This floating power station is the will of the Russian state. The head of Rosatom designed this unique prototype, the first of its kind, to supply electricity to isolated areas north of the Arctic Circle. We must develop this territory together with the development of the country. But maybe, regarding the Arctic, this question is a little more difficult, because this is a unique region, and from the point of view of the ecological corruption, и с точки зрения, конечно, тех непростых, тяжелых условий, в которых живут здесь люди, можно в Арске изменить все, кроме погоды, как известно, поэтому... The 
floating nuclear power plant is leaving on a four-month journey. It will travel 4,000 kilometers to reach a small port of only 5,000 inhabitants. Pivek, north of the Bering Strait. This power station is a symbol of Vladimir Putin's desire to conquer the Arctic. The Arctic is the world's new Eldorado. Its subsurface is full of riches, gold, uranium, rare soil and, of course, oil and gas. Today it is the envy of the eight countries that surround it, including the United States and especially Russia, which has the largest territory in the area. What's more, global warming is making the Arctic's natural resources even more accessible. These NASA images show the state of the Arctic sea ice. In 40 years, it has lost 40% of its surface area, opening up new navigation routes and facilitating the exploitation of mineral mining resources. This presents an opportunity for Vladimir Putin, who is increasing projects like this huge liquefied gas plant built on the icy ground north of the Arctic Circle. Si Poutine n'exploite pas l'Arctique russe, Poutine ne restera pas au pouvoir en Russie. And with regards to the Kremlin, this conquest also involves the militarization of the region. In the Arctic, the Russian army is stepping up its demonstration of force and building spectacular bases on islands that were previously virtually uninhabited. This is enough to frighten the other countries in the Arctic zone who now fear being invaded by Russia. China, what is happening? We have a border to uh, Russia in the north, so you never know. Putin is crazy. NATO decided to send a strong message to the Kremlin to show that it could push back a Russian invasion at any time. The Atlantic Alliance organized the landing of 35,000 strong army in Norway. L'ennemi auquel on est confronté a autant de capacité que nous, et dans certains domaines, parfois, il nous est supérieur. But there is also a Russian presence in the Arctic that worries NATO. Settlements in northern Norway, former coal mines that have been there for 90 years. Definitely frozen in time, so uh, it looks nice, but I'm curious how it was to be uh, actually here, you know. Russian enclaves in the heart of NATO that Putin doesn't want to give up at any cost. The target of Kremlin ambition, the Arctic has become a new zone of international tension. Two years after its launch in the port of Murmansk, we were allowed to go and see the floating nuclear power plant. This was before the war in Ukraine. To reach the confines of the Russian Arctic, we will need two days of travel and no less than four planes. We are meeting at Magadan Airport in the Russian Far East. To reach the Arctic Circle, Rosatom, the nuclear giant, has chartered a special plane. An old Antonov from the 1980s, a relic of the former USSR. A propeller-driven aircraft capable of landing on short runways and in extreme weather conditions. Inside, Rosatom officials and a dozen journalists. Some Westerners, but also Russians, as it is the first time the media are given access. We leave Magadan, small town in the far east of Russia and we will go all the way north to Pivik, the port where the nuclear power station is located. A five-hour flight over nearly deserted areas. Pivik is considered by the Russian authorities as a sensitive area 
normally forbidden to foreigners. To get here, you need a special permit validated by the Army and the FSB, the Russian Secret Service. The town is located 15 kilometers from the airport. We walk along ruined buildings and disused factories. The region was famous for its uranium mines where the prisoners of the gulags worked. And suddenly, at a bend in the road, the floating nuclear power plant appears, moored at the entrance to the town. Pevek, long, brightly colored five-story buildings on the edge of the Arctic Ocean. A city plunged into darkness three months a year because of the polar night. Extreme conditions, minus 40 degrees in winter, and icy winds that can reach 200 kilometers an hour. Five thousand people live here in this remote part of the world. Meet Nadia. С вами мариновать. Вот кто будет приправу? Вот смотри, Кристиан. Вот приправу будем посыпать. Рост не стала дочь. She lives here with her husband and their three daughters. Ну давай рукой, давай чуть-чуть. Давай. Ма вот так? Да. Юкой, мам. Ма юкой. Давай, давай, давай. And then you would have to go and wash your hands. The family has lived okay. here for 10 years. The husband, Paul, is an engineer in a gold mine. Nadia, who did a part of her studies in the United States, has had to learn to adapt to the constraints of life in the Arctic. The extreme cold, but most of all, the food supply. Well, we don't have like farming or gardening here in, uh, in our area because the summer is so short and we cannot grow any food uh, food from the ground. So all, all the food is brought here by ships from the end of July to, to I think, November. It's in our area, it's called navigation. The big ships are coming over. They bring everything. They bring food, clothes, and they, they must bring enough food for the entire year. And during winter time? In winter, we only have uh, planes coming over with food. The plane brings food, but it's very expensive. Nadia and her husband agreed to show us behind the scenes of daily life in Pivik. It is October, and snow and ice are not yet forcing the town's inhabitants indoors. It is minus 10 degrees, almost spring-like weather, for the couple used to the extreme winter temperatures. The first thing that strikes you when you walk through the streets of Pivek is the absence of a town center. Just a succession of buildings, no shops, no windows. There are um, grocery shops and they are located on the first story building because we do not have separate buildings like for the stores. From here we can see t at least two shops, one, two, and uh, around, around the, corner. the corner. But how can you see there is a shop? The well, sign. This, the sign. <laughs> you can see the little sign over there on the top. <laughs> These are the little signs at the entrance of the building that indicate the presence of the shops. Like here, the grocery shop Nadia frequents. Inside the grocery shop, entire walls are covered with goods. Not a single space is free from floor to ceiling. The owner stores enough food to last through the winter because for six months the ocean is frozen and no boats can reach Pelek. This morning she's worried because a 20-ton container of food she ordered has still not arrived. 
Мы загрузили реф контейнер из Москвы, получили продукцию. Там более 20 тонн идет в реф контейнере. В Архангельске у нас сейчас в связи с ледовой обстановкой не могу сказать, что поставщики те, которые обязались доставить нам сюда груз, они не берут контейнера, в контейнера все стоят в Архангельске. Вот в течение второго месяца мы не можем с Архангельска морским путем получить свой контейнер именно с заморозкой для людей жизни необходимыми продуктами. То есть это мясо, рыба, морепродукты, полуфабрикаты. Вот второй месяц стоим, ждем. The other problem is fresh produce, such as fruit and vegetables. In winter, only a few planes connect Pivek to the rest of the world. If the plane comes once a month, we get fruits and vegetables once a month. If the plane comes once in two months, then we get once in two months. As a result, fruit and vegetables here are considered luxury products. Nine euros for a kilo of oranges, 10 euros for pears, and 12 euros for a kilo of cucumber or tomatoes. It's expensive, but wages here are 30 to 50 percent higher than in the rest of the country, and heating and electricity are free. Because the state wants to encourage Russians to settle in Pevek to exploit the region's natural riches, like gold and uranium. The problem? The old coal-fired power station isn't powerful enough to power the mines. So today, Russia bets its hopes on the floating atomic power station. The ship is moored on a special pontoon. Articulated arms are used to stabilize the vessel in case of rising water levels. The reactor was activated in December 2019. Inside, a labyrinth of corridors and pipes. Our guide is Kirill Toporov, the plant director. He takes us to the heart of the nuclear power plant. Мы с вами сейчас находимся в машинном отделении номер один. Это правый борт. Здесь размещено основное генерирующее оборудование. Это турбина Калужского турбинного завода и генератор силовых машин. Реактор там дальше. Там дальше. Rosatom's engineers and workers aren't used to having cameras on board, and it stressed them out a bit. On the other hand, there's no problem with filming the relaxation areas provided for employees, such as this gym. A total of 130 people work here full time, some sleeping on the port and others inside the plant itself. They work in shifts, 24 hours a day. The floating power plant operates using two reactors, the same type as those used on nuclear submarines or the French Navy's aircraft carrier, the Charles de Gaulle. The energy produced there is far superior to the need of PEVEX 5,000 inhabitants. The energy is able to power the static city. Why do you bring this nuclear plant in PEVEX? In соответствии с дорожной картой развития энергетики Российской Федерации предполагается обеспечение электроэнергии развивающихся горнорудных компаний, которые здесь уже сейчас размещаются и будут добывать полезные ископаемые для обеспечения вот этих мощных потребителей и будет использован плавающий энергоблок. 
For Rosatome, these plants represent a future market. They can supply electricity to the most remote parts of the world. The Kremlin has ordered three new ones to be installed in the Arctic. Are they more dangerous than conventional power plants? It's too early to tell. In any case, PVEX inhabitants weren't consulted and had no other choice but to accept. Are you sometimes afraid? Afraid? At the beginning I was. <laughs> I mean, at the beginning I think everybody was afraid. Because this is something new, we've never seen, we, we haven't heard how this thing works, you know. Everybody was afraid. But with time everybody got used to. A peaceful machine is over there and uh, we're all hoping that it, it will uh, produce energy and heat and electricity for, the, for our region, for our area. And um, we're hoping for that and we're praying for safety. We're praying for safety of that flo uh, floating um, plant and for the safety of our area. Nadja and Paul are choosing to think about only the positive aspects of the arrival of the power station. Рабочие места образовываются, и у нас тепло дома, у нас свет горит. <laughs> вот, и я думаю, это хороший проект для такого отдаленного региона. The city has changed a lot in two years. The secondary school and sixth form have been renovated. Playgrounds have been built in front of the endless blocks of buildings. All of this thanks to money from Rosatom. Every effort is being made to attract new inhabitants and investors. With this power station, the Kremlin hopes to make Pevek the spearhead of its conquest to the far north. In Russia, the Arctic zone represents approximately 20% of the country's total area. It is a sparsely populated area with an abundance of natural resources. For the past 15 years, Vladimir Putin has made it his number one priority. He takes regular trips to the most remote regions of the Arctic. Like here in 2017, during an expedition to the François Joseph Archipelago, the northernmost islands in the country. There, he once again states his intentions. For Mika Meret, this figure is far from being overestimated. A teacher at Sciences Po, Meret specializes in the geopolitics of the Poles. According to him, exploitation of the Arctic is of paramount importance to the Russian government. Comme la Russie est une économie extractive dont la valeur ajoutée c'est tout simplement extraire des choses du sol et les vendre à l'étranger, eh bien tout simplement, il faut aller vers le nord. Pour la Russie, c'est absolument indispensable. Si Poutine n'exploite pas l'Arctique russe, Poutine ne restera pas au pouvoir en Russie. Les choses sont très claires. C'est-à-dire qu'aujourd'hui, l'Arctique est le premier gisement de croissance pour l'ensemble du système des oligarques russes. The Putin era's most spectacular achievement can be found on the Yamal Peninsula, 600 kilometers north of the Arctic Circle. A gigantic industrial plant built on stilts on the permafrost, the Arctic's frozen ground. Its purpose? To exploit the region's gas deposits and export liquid gas to the entire world. 
thanks to giant ships, LNG tankers that can sail through the ice. Yamal reaches minus 40 degrees in winter, and for four months, it's shrouded in the darkness of the polar night. The construction took five years, and in 2017, Vladimir Putin himself came to inaugurate it. With this project, which he made his own personal challenge, he proved that Russia can build huge industrial infrastructures in the polar zone. Here is his message to the Russian population. And if Putin has succeeded in carrying out this extraordinary project, it is all thanks to the French company Total. The petrol giant participated in the construction of the plant and today owns 20%. This is where Total and its partners joined forces to develop Yamal LNG. On the group's website, there is a video from 2016 in which Total CEO Patrick Poyané celebrates the investment. Yamal is one of the most reserves of gas in the world, from which we can alimentate the European market and the European market asiatic. The gas is the future energy that will be developed. We will, thanks to this project, find new bases of growth for the future for our enterprise. We wanted to ask the company's manager about Yamal, but since the start of the war in Ukraine, radio silence. The oil company refuses to discuss this sensitive subject. The only thing we know is that Total hasn't withdrawn from the project. Est-ce que aujourd'hui Total est capable de s'asseoir sur ce qui devait à l'horizon 2050 représenter ce qui allait permettre au groupe de continuer sa prospérité dans le secteur du gaz A priori, pas complètement. The Russian Arctic is thought to contain 20% of gas reserves yet to be discovered on the planet. A gift that Total doesn't want to give up for one very simple reason. Pendant que la Russie est mise au banc des nations occidentales et que les entreprises européennes sortent de l'Arctique russe, que les gouvernements demandent à leurs entreprises de sortir de l'Arctique russe ou de Russie en général, il y a des gouvernements sans scrupules qui disent bah, c'est pas grave, moi je prends la place. Il y a les Japonais pour lesquels c'est trop important d'être en Russie par rapport à la ressource énergétique. Il y a les Coréens. For the same reason, and then there are others, even more scrupulous, like India, like Turkey, like Arabia Saudi, and many others, who say to their enterprises, on the contrary, go ahead, these resources on which you hope to put the hand, and that the French, the Italians, the Belgians, the Netherlands, whatever you want, have paid, now that they are gone, that the chance will take its place, go ahead, and they will go. Today in Jamal, new gas projects are already underway and the Kremlin is only accelerating the construction of icebreakers. Because thanks to the melting of the ice pack, a new sea route has appeared. The Northeast Passage, allowing cargo ships to link Asia to Europe via the South in 20 days instead of 40. A sea route the Kremlin wants to control. For this endeavor, Putin has begun to remilitarize the whole region. In less than 15 years, former military bases of the USSR have been renovated and four new ones built, one of which is located on the island of Kotelny. This is the Northern Clover, the largest and most spectacular base, painted in the nation's colors. It is the undisputed pride of the Northern Fleet, 
the army controlling the entire Russian Arctic. The base can accommodate up to 250 men. The Ministry of Defense has invited around 20 journalists to the base, both Russian and Western. On the program, a demonstration of Russian strength. And a presentation of the latest model of missile truck. The message of this organized visit is crystal clear. The Kremlin wants to show the world that the Arctic is its newest hunting ground. But NATO won't sit back as Russia presents itself as the only dominant power in the region. A spectacular display is on the way. Let's head to Norway, one of the eight states in the Arctic bordering Russia. It is now March 2022, one month after the outbreak of war in Ukraine. A French warship, the Dixmude, awaits in the middle of the fjord. End of the alert and end of the exercise. There are no enemy aircraft. The Dixmude is not at war, but it may as well be. The French helicopter is participating in a large-scale NATO operation. It is simulating a war in the Arctic where Norway has just been involved by a powerful enemy army. NATO armies have one goal, to rescue it. The mission is called Cold Response. Its aim to train NATO armies to fight north of the Arctic Circle. Radar, est-ce qu'on a des pistes sur la prochaine route? Captain Emmanuel Mouka is in command of the Dixmude. He considers the exercise more than justified. Today, the French Navy has to be completely ready to conduct combat in the open sea, in the Arctic or elsewhere. In the space maritime, it's been 10 or 15 years on s'aperçoit que les, les relations entre les États se durcissent et que le combat naval est redevenu une hypothèse de travail. Vraiment, vraiment. On sent les, tens, enfin, les rapports qui se durcissent. En tout cas, ce qui est sûr, c'est qu'on insiste à un réarmement naval euh, de nombreux pays à travers le monde et on sait, on sait que les tensions sont, sont présentes. Bonjour à tous. Repos. Allez, c'est parti. And in the fjords, the ship's captain really will be conducting a war operation as he organizes the landing of a French army regiment on a Norwegian beach. On board the ship are 300 men of the 1st Rima, the regiment of marine infantry and more than 80 combat vehicles, including three AMX-30 tanks. The Dixmude is not only a helicopter carrier, it also has landing crafts. With the tanks on board, they speed along the fjords at almost 50 kilometers an hour. The crew get to experience firsthand the extreme climatic conditions of the Arctic because the Dixmude is based in Toulon and was therefore designed to maneuver the Mediterranean. Le 
The weather in the fjords is changeable and erratic, but it's absolutely essential that all of the men and armor reach the shore before nightfall. The operation will last eight hours. On the shore, the inhabitants of this small fishing village watch the ship approach with interest. Since the start of the war in Ukraine, the Norwegians who live here have been wary of a possible Russian invasion. I don't want to think about it, but uh, I think about it more than I want. We are a small country. We are a long country, but not so many people. And uh, Russia is big. So yes, I think about it. So NATO is more important now? Yes. We are very happy that NATO is uh, around here. Why are you really happy? Yeah, you can see in Ukraine what is happening. We have a border to uh, Russia in the north, so you never know. Putin is crazy. Putin, a crazy man. So it means you feel safer? Of course, of course. At the same time, only 20 kilometers away from the French arrivals, more soldiers are landing on the beach. These are the US Marines, coming directly from North Carolina with their amphibious vehicles and their well-practiced speeches. I think the Marine Corps is always ready. Uh, regardless of the status in the world, the United States Marine Corps is a force in readiness. We are ready at a moment's notice to act anywhere around the globe. And that's why exercises like cold response are so important to who we are. We are prepared, ready, postured, and prepared to operate in the high north when needed. 35,000 soldiers from 28 allied countries are taking part in this operation. Here, they'll face a genuine enemy. Hiding in the mountains, in ambush, appear the Norwegian army, playing the role of the bad guy. Their tanks are equipped with thermal cameras, and their camouflage techniques are perfectly adapted to the Nordic environment. They are ready to confront the NATO troops. We will uh, do a uh, slow down the enemy for uh, quite a distance uh, north. And uh, when we have done that, we'll uh, regroup and prepare for an uh, attack. The Norwegians are playing at home in climatic conditions they could navigate with their eyes closed. A normal winter up here, it goes down to minus 30, minus 35, and uh, we're uh, more than capable to fight in that uh, environment. But the other army, you think they can? Uh, with a little praxis, like we're doing now, they uh, will uh, be able to, <laughs> yeah. The battle will last two weeks over an area as big as a French overseas department. Uh, to, to this we have one, two, three, four objectives. Okay. Boasting warships and submarines, tanks, helicopter gunships and fighter jets, NATO's strength is truly spectacular. Okay, Guillaume, c'est bon? For Colonel Le Gouvelot, okay. who's leading the French offensive, the challenge is not only to get used to the region's extreme weather conditions. After years of war against terrorist groups, the French army needs to prepare itself to fight against regular armies again, armies that are modern and well-equipped. On a fait beaucoup d'opérations en Afrique, en Afghanistan, etc. C'était euh, c'était pas du combat haute intensité. Donc là, on se réoriente vers du combat de haute intensité, euh, vers la confrontation avec un ennemi qui est à parité avec nous. Et, euh, et dans, en ce sens, finalement, cet exercice, c'est exactement ça. C'est-à-dire que l'ennemi auquel on est confronté a autant de capacités que nous, et dans certains domaines, parfois, il nous est supérieur. The enemy everyone is thinking about is, of course, Russia. But for diplomatic reasons, none of the soldiers on the field refers to it. In Paris, at the Ministry of Defense, the discourse is far more direct. 
for General Lani, spokesman for the General Staff, the development of military force is sending a direct message to Moscow. L'Arctique est un espace de compétition. Ce n'est pas encore un espace de, de confrontation ou d'affrontement. Aujourd'hui, c'est un espace de compétition. C'est un peu comme le jeu de go ou un jeu d'échecs, suivant ce qu'on qu choisit. Et en fait, euh, chacun place ses pions. Ce que font les Russes en ouvrant des bases ou en montrant ce dont ils sont capables, ce que fait l'OTAN en montrant ce dont elle est capable. Est-ce que vous pensez que la Russie a compris le message alors, je ne sais pas si la Russie a compris le message, il faudrait leur poser la question. Une chose est certaine, c'est que nous avons montré, l'OTAN a montré que l'organisation était capable de projeter plusieurs dizaines de milliers d'hommes dans un scénario de haute intensité à plusieurs dizaines de milliers de kilomètres des bases des unités. Et ça, ça c'est un vrai signal stratégique. À any rate, le message was well received by the Arctic countries. Two months after the end of the exercise, Sweden and Finland officially applied for NATO membership. But there is also a far more discreet Russian presence in the Arctic. Today, NATO is worried about two settlements in the heart of Norway. Barentsburg and Pyramidal are located in the heart of the Svalbard archipelago. Barentsburg is a Russian enclave that has been legally established on Norwegian soil for 90 years. A village of 400 inhabitants floating in the middle of the glaciers. Barentsburg was built in the 1930s to exploit a coal mine. We were able to shoot here before the invasion of Ukraine. Everything here reminded us of the motherland, the Orthodox Church, the colorful low-rise buildings typical of contemporary Russia, and right in the middle of the main square, Lenin's bust. The mine is still in operation, its facade recently renovated. Ну что, здравствуйте. Меня зовут Руслан. Я шахтер. Это, значит, ламповая, где производится зарядка аккумуляторных Ruslan is Russian. He's the chief engineer and has been working in the Barentsburg mine for three years. Ну конечно. Люди, которые отработали не один год, да, два, три года, все равно туда тянет. Это как космонавтов тянет в космос. The mine is dangerous. Ruslan is responsible for its safety. Замкнутое пространство, протяженность горных выработок и условия. Это, во-первых, в шахтах сверхкатегорийная по газу метану, опасно по взрывчатости угольной пыли. The security measures are draconian. We have to shoot with a special camera. The mine was dug into the permafrost and has a depth of almost 500 meters below the ground. It dates back to 1932. The Russians were able to settle here at that time because a 1920 treaty allowed foreign countries to exploit Svalbard's natural resources. Powdered coal can be seen in the wagons. Этот уголь прошел через технологический комплекс поверхности, где был обработан отсен на мелкие фракции, и такой уголь предназначен для сжигания именно на ТЭЦ и отправляется к поставщикам на материк. One hundred thirty miners work here twenty-four hours a day. To entice them, Russia offers good salaries. But the mine hasn't been profitable in years. The coal is scarce and of poor quality. In fact, it's mainly used to provide heat and electricity to the town. But the Russians will never give up this strategic position in the heart of Europe. The proof lies in the construction of this brand new consulate, with its bunker-like appearance. 
Inside, a marble staircase and a small fountain can be found. The owner of the building is a peculiar-looking consul named Sergei Gushin. Appointed in 2018, Gushin is now 51 years old. Usually, uh, consuls uh, uh, who, who came here, they uh, were near their retirement. So they were quite old people and uh, it was their last assignment and then retirement. But, but you're very young. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you're very young. You're, you're because young. because uh, it was my dream to come here. According to the 1920 treaty, the Russians only have the right to retain the colony if they have economic activity there. So the consul had a brilliant new idea to develop tourism in the area. The coal mining is getting less profitable each year. And uh, three uh, years uh, since 2015, there's been more profit from the tourism than from coal mining. So tourism is growing, coal mining is decreasing, but still we, we, we have to have this coal mining operations because it's our, you know, a fundament for our presence here. In a bid to attract tourists to this remote part of the world, the Russians have decided to exploit a spectacular, remarkable place. Another Russian colony in Svalbard is located just three and a half hours by boat from Barentsburg. Every week during the summer season, a boat takes tourists on an unforgettable journey back in time. There you see leftovers of a hunting cabin. There. They date back to different times. On board is Tobias, a German guide who has been working in the archipelago so for 10 years. He shows tourists buildings along the coast that were built by Russian pioneers. Their presence on the archipelago goes back over a century. And Tobias has his own ideas about how Russia have managed to hold on to Svalbard for so long. Now when the glacier retreat, the glaciers, there will be more things to find, I guess. So even, you know, maybe even more what coal, mean? minerals, I don't know, maybe even gold, maybe oil, I don't know. So maybe there is a reason there because why they want to be like here and be present. And as soon as you leave a place forever, it's hard to get back again, right? The boat arrives at its destination, an almost abandoned port, littered with rusty cranes and industrial ruins. Um, so welcome to Russia. No, I'm just kidding. Welcome to Pyramiden. Um, from here on, he will be your guide. I will just follow the group and uh, hold you together. It's very important that we keep as a group because we never know there could be a polar bear. So he has the rifle. I only have a signal gun, so stay close to us. Sure, try. The armed man in the red jacket is a Russian guide. So He'll be giving us the tour. Let's go exploring, guys. In the middle of the Arctic glaciers, the tourists will discover a fascinating relic from the former USSR. Pyramid. This former coal mine, abandoned in 1998, is now a ghost town. Here, time has stood still. The town was once home to up to 1,000 inhabitants. A Russian company now manages the site, transformed into a tourist attraction. Every year, 20,000 tourists come and battle the extreme weather conditions to see what life was like in the USSR era. Ivan is one of the 10 Russian tour guides. He always starts his visits with the bust of Comrade Lenin. As soon as we're gonna enter the stairs to the culture house and you face the view over there, then you will realize that this Comrade having the best view ever in the world. <laughs> Let's go, gentlemen to the northernmost school and kindergarten. Yeah, 
that will follow you with the great emotions. In the school, everything is still exactly in place. In 1998, the inhabitants of Pyramiden left with just their personal belongings, leaving any furniture behind. Many thought that the closure of the mine was only temporary. The dormitory is still intact, and on the desk lie abandoned school books from the period. Then you have the physical culture, mathematics, Russian literature. Another building was reserved for recreational activities, with a sports hall and even a swimming pool. Everything was provided to ensure the inhabitants' comfort. No, I mean, it's definitely frozen in time, so... Uh, but, uh, yeah, it looks nice, but I'm curious how it was to be uh, actually here, you know? Oh, when, uh, in Soviet times? You yeah, mean. like if it was nice or if it just looks nice, you know? To answer this question, the guides have planned a surprise Go visit. Inside, guys the Pyramiden Cinema, which houses a real treasure. So this is the storage of a judgment day. If everybody will left, we're going to be placed over here. We're going to hide in here. A total of 600 films from the Soviet era are stored here. Invaluable nuggets of information, perfectly preserved thanks to the extreme cold. Stanislav is in charge of restoring these films. Stanislav man, as a Spider-Man, goes up. <laughs> he has even brought the projection room back to life to show tourists his findings. Propaganda films made in the 1980s encouraged Russians to come and work in Pyramid. They promised the perfect life, wealth that the Russians could only dream of because, at the time, they had nothing. School and healthcare were also free, and more importantly, miners could earn up to seven times the national wage in the Soviet Union. After the screening, tourists are treated to a musical performance. Dear friends, we have the left hand, we have the right hand. I don't have the left On the program today, rock music. Russian, of course. On the bass, we have a special guest. The consul who, for the occasion, has abandoned his three-piece suit. And to finish with a bang, some folklore with Kalinka, the traditional Russian anthem. Well, that was before the war in Ukraine. Today, tourists are rare because Norwegian ships have decided to stop sending their ships to this destination. As for the Russians, they've not budged and seem more determined than ever to keep their colonies in the heart of Europe.